Hi, I'm Jamie Philbrook with IamRogue.com. I'm here with director Gavin Hood, who directed Ender's Game, coming out on Blu-ray and DVD. And we just had a chance, uh, you and I were in the volume yeah. uh, on the stage, and uh, I got to operate the motion camera, and you got to direct me a little <laughs> bit, which was fun. I got to hire you, man. Yeah, you're, that's you're, great. You're, I don't know about my DP great. skills, <laughs> but... <laughs> no, I think you were better in that lollipop in that thing. Did you do the spinning right, I got around? to do that too, right, the zero, where we kind of simulated the, the zero gravity. That's the right. Well, let me first ask you about that motion camera, uh, motion capture, and mm. that's how you did the video game... The portions. giant and the mouse right, and right. stuff. Yeah. So let's say that Richard, just for the fun of this, let's say that Richard is coming in and he's going to go to that position and sit down and you're going to meet him. Okay. So you're going to end up coming into a shot where you frame him as that fist goes down here like this. Okay. But you're starting off in a wide and seeing mm -hmm. that giant, just for fun. And you're going to move that camera up as he goes. So I don't actually need to zoom, I'm just going to move You're, you're going to physically do the move, okay. as if we want a dolly track in the also. Got it. But I'm using you as a kind of steady cam operator now, so you're going to come okay. up into the shot. Okay. Perfect. Okay. And it, uh, let's just see what happens. And are we ready? And action. Awesome. Now, what we'll do, this I'm just giving you a hint of what it's like to work for a crazy person. Yeah. yeah. So here's what's the problem. <laughs> All right. So now you're coming in, it's like, okay, I'm nervous and I'm coming in. But if we think about it, this is a dynamic move. The giant's coming forward, he's going, ah. So if you match that dynamic move, I get twice the dynamism out of it. Right? So feel his energy. Okay. Now you're an actor. You're going to feel his energy and you're going to come up like anything. It's going to go, oh, and all smooth. Okay, got and it. If you fail, <laughs> you're off the set. <laughs> all right, just for fun. Here we go. You okay. ready? Yep. So get your body into a position where you can move, all right? So you're ready to move. All right, got here it. we go. Ready and action. Ah, okay, a little bit more energy. <laughs> we have some great camera operators and guys who can really move and be very close. How was that? That, that was, was cool. That was great. Well that done. was great being directed by awesome. Gavin Hood. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did awesome. That was great. Well done. Well done. Do you ask that from your, like you just mentioned, sort of getting a performance out of the cameraman as well? I mean, do you, is that in something like this? No, it's a great question. Them? I think one of the things that it, one of the, job, the jobs that a director has is to it is to impart the energy of the scene, whether that scene is high energy or tranquil. Because there's something about everybody on the set, especially the camera operator, the dolly grip, whoever's working that set, being in sync about what the particular energy or mood of that scene is at that moment. So it doesn't help an actor to be doing something in a certain way and for the camera operator somehow to be counter to that mood. That's fine. And sometimes you've got a locked off shot and you're just looking and that's fine. But when you're in any kind of dynamic mood, a, a cameraman can so affect the mood of a scene. If it's, if it's gentle and, s and, and subtle and there's a real subtle moment, and maybe the camera's just creeping. And if you've got an operator who just doesn't get that and goes, uh, it's like, mate, it's painful. It's like, some, it's like a bad music note in, in, a, in a good composer's ear. Just listen to feather in and then land. Feel the energy. And those dances together all help, I think, create a, a beautiful scene. But with the great so, yes. cinematographer, you probably don't have to give them, like working with a great actor, you probably have little direction. They feel it, exactly, that exactly. That's why you hire great, talented people. There's, if you're looking at steady cam operators, there are steady cam operators who are just so connected to what that actor is doing. And they're watching and looking for that mood. Um, and you know when you've hired someone bad, when, I, I, it's very seldom, but I have had the odd occasion where you've got a, person in the camera department, maybe on the dolly, maybe on the camera, who's just not feeling it. And, and their movements are just, mm, they're not in tune with the energy of the scene. And, and in a scene like this, if something's moving, then that camera's got to have some sort of ability to be agile. Anyway, enough said. Great Very job. cool. Awesome. Great job. Nice, huh? Great job. So the, so the motion capture, which I hope your audience will see, um, and if they don't, it's on the DVD, um, um, is, is a remarkable tool because you know, you, you dress up in these strange outfits with little white dots all over you that 70 cameras all around the room pick up on the data of that and recreate um, basically a three-dimensional replication of the movements you did so that the animation, animators have got reference points to work off um, in, in terms of the movement of a character. So in this case, the giant, who's a sort of big, ugly thing. Did you play? Just like, I you played the giant, did, yes, right? and they made me look far more handsome than, 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 than was fair. They did a great job. Hopefully you don't even know it's me. And, um, but, but the movements, uh, I was able to do the movements knowing where I wanted the camera to be, and then once I've captured those movements, 
I can take the virtual camera and shoot, ironically, myself, very narcissistic. Mm. I can photograph myself as the giant and say, here's the shots, and then hand that sh sequence edited to the animators, and they then overlay their extraordinary, beautiful giant onto my, you know, dot-covered body. Right. And, um, and it speeds up the process rather than them having to animate it entirely from scratch. They have a lot, in particular when you record using um, multiple dots on a face, they, they, they are able to use the expression of an actor. Um, and, and instead of saying, well, should he raise his eyebrow now? I mean, facial movements are so complex that to have that amount of movement happening and for the animator to have a sort of blueprint to follow is, is really helpful in terms of giving it a kind of... Um, truthful, if you like, emotional feel. Well, and tell me about the importance of getting the young actors trained in the zero gravity. All right, so here's what I want you to first do, okay? okay. This is how I always, always taught kids. The hardest thing to do is try to achieve this Superman flying position, okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to stretch your arms out and you're going to let yourself tilt forward and try to hold yourself completely flat. Don't go over, okay? Okay. So here's what you're going to do. Reach way out through my hands right here. Oh, wow. Three. <laughs> Try not to, try, okay. there you go. Try not to flip up. Got it. All right, now. <laughs> <laughs> and now you know this, that's the reason why this was such a great zero G effect, because if you do this in zero G and it keeps on rotating, you get it? Yeah. That would happen in I'm zero G in outer space, too. You completely rotate, you can't stop. <laughs> that's why we did it. Good. Now hold it right there. Hold your stomach muscles tight. Find your balance. Okay. Good, there you go, nice. Now, in order to make yourself do a complete rotation, what you're gonna do is stretch your arms way out in front of you. You'll tilt completely down and let your heels kick around so you try to touch yourself in the back of your head with your heels. So am I gonna like flip? You got it, you're gonna okay. make one full rotation. You ready? Okay. Set, go. Whoa! <laughs> Good. Yeah. Try wow. those heels though, those heels okay. don't come out yet. You used all your hands. Once your hands go and your body they gets completely, my heels you up. got it. Once you get completely upside down, Take your heels and try to touch the back of your head. Okay. All right, you ready? Set, go. Reach out and fall. Heels. Set. Did I do it? Yeah, you Whoa! did it. <laughs> you did it so well, you kept going over. Now, here's the last fun thing we do in the ring. You're going to find yourself at a 45 degree angle like this. Kurt will help you, actually. Go okay. ahead and turn him a little bit more like this. 45. Good. Now, here's the thing. You're going to just do this rotation and see how fast you can spin yourself. Okay. Now, the idea is that you want to hold your body completely tight and just squeeze your stomach so that you favor one side. And you'll start to rotate. You'll okay. feel it. Go ahead and do it. Keep your legs if straight I'm almost. Trying yep. to go one way. So what you want to do is just basically, whatever your favorite way to go is. Yeah, good. Try to keep your body tight. Try to keep your body tight. If you don't keep it tight, you'll wobble. Is that? You there you go, you yeah! got it. You got it. Nice, good. Right, time. <laughs> now I'm dizzy. Good. <laughs> All right, take it down. Good job. Awesome, man. man. Thanks. My pleasure. That was so cool. It was great. It was a great experience. And it was fun to see, like, that's what the kids had to go through every day. Exactly. Now, the hard thing is that you did a really good job, actually. You picked it up very quickly, which was good. However, as you saw, you weren't able to control yourself very well. Sometimes right. you'd speed up, sometimes you'd slow down. The reason why it took two weeks to teach them how to do this is so that they wouldn't speed up and slow down. So they would constantly be in this non-stop movement that never, ever sped up. So it looked like they were in Okay. So yeah. it was two weeks of training that they had? Two weeks of training, about three days each week, you know, maybe four days each week. Almost for about an hour and a half is what they would get. They would spend about 10 minutes in the ring, and then they would take a break, and then they'd come back in. So they are real comfortable when they got on the set and had you got it for real. Yep. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Thanks man. man. First of all, the kids could only work five hours a day because they've got to be in school for three or four right. hours a day. They've got to do homework. There's a whole lot of demands on them. Um, and so when I get Asa, I can only work with him for five hours a day. So um, I need him really well prepared because when I'm shooting with 300 crew and it's real money being spent, you don't want to be wasting time while he goes, I don't know if this harness fits and how do I do this? Am I full upside down? So that's where pre-production is so important. Before you're spending all this money on camera departments and design, you put these kids with the stunt coordinator as, a training, tra as their trainer. We had some Cirque du Soleil performers who worked with them. They learn how to hang in those wires, move in that lollipop rig that you were in, develop abdominal strength that um, is so essential to this kind of movement. And we also put them with military training instructors, teach them how to march, teach them how to salute, teach them how to do all those kinds of things. Um, and the real astronauts worked with them on how it feels to be in zero gravity. So by the time they got on the set, they were physically, they'd physically mastered what would be required of them 
and we could concentrate on the emotional work that's happening between them in a scene, the dialogue, the emotional responses uh, between Haley Steinfeld and Asa Butterfield, and Haley's completely uh, comfortable with being in this harness thing. She's not complaining to me about, I think they want to get down. And by the way, none of them complain. They're an extraordinary <laughs> group, extraordinary group of yeah. dedicated young people. Um, there's so much attention pay, uh, that you guys pay to lighting and everything in the mm. previous situation yes. to, to make sure that you knew exactly storyboarding, knew what you wanted. Yes. Did you still, as a director and with the actors, leave room on the day of shooting to sort of find moments and ha have those sort of magic moments be found, or was it very strict to knowing what it's you a, It's a very know? good question. There's a fine line. Um, you never want to be so rigid that you're not open to a moment of, wow, that way, that, that really works better. Um, but when you're doing in particular scenes where people are hanging in wires and flying around a room and doing dialogue suspended and hanging on to these stars, it's generally better to have a very good plan. Because if you go out there and try and busk it, and you, that's when you know, the time just runs away with you. The kid's got to leave in five hours. So the, the, the better you previs and plan and storyboard, the, the more you know that you have the scene and once you have the scene, you can always say, you know what, let's just push that a little further. Mm -hmm. But if you don't plan at all, what's that famous phrase? That's planning to fail. Rip planning. Um, so good preparation, I actually think, allows you to grab opportunities when they present themselves um, rather than inhibits it. Uh, last question I have mm. to ask you. Sequel, are you, I, is there talk about I have no idea. It? We have, Would you well, want to return? Because well, obviously the books and the movie lead themselves to they that. They do, but here's the tricky thing, as you probably know, the sequel book, Speaker for the Dead, which is a great book, takes place 30 years later. So I don't know if we want to wait 30 years for the sequel. <laughs> so there, um, in order to create a sequel that would carry our young cast that we love through a... a um, a, a sequel have to be written to fill that gap. Mm -hmm. And there are books that, that, that um, were written that fill that gap, but it's not as simple as saying, oh, here's the next book. It directly follows. It's, it's, um, it's something that we're giving a lot of thought to. Good. Well, I look forward to that. And hey, Thank always you. great to talk to you, Gavin. Nice Thanks for spending the time with me today. Thanks. I nice to see it. you again.